scientists are trained and taught to be objective and working from empirical data that is reproducible and, and to extract any kind of emotion as irrational artifactual noise. And this is a very unfortunate binary that I wanted to antagonize. I'm Nathan Maharaj, and this is Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Britt Ray, broadcaster, science writer, and researcher at the intersection of mental health and climate change. Her new book is Generation Dread, Finding Purpose in an Age of Climate Crisis, which is a deeply felt and thoroughly researched study of what it means to wake up every day and live our lives on this warming planet of ours. Britt Ray, welcome to Kobo. Hi, thanks so much, Nathan. Good to be here. I want to start by helping our listeners understand some terms that are key to your new book. Um, For listeners who have been blissfully living without um, experiencing eco-anxiety, or perhaps haven't heard the terms eco-anxiety, climate anxiety, can you explain a little bit about these labels um, that apply to this whole sort of family of difficult feelings? Absolutely. So climate anxiety and ecological anxiety, very closely related terms, are used to describe the distress on an emotional level that a person can feel when confronting the severity of the climate predicament that we're faced with and wider planetary health crisis in terms of biodiversity crisis, land transformation, water scarcity, vector-borne diseases becoming more dangerous, you name it, as a result of the human project overriding the planet's capacity to sustain our way of life writ large. And so the American Psychological Association defines eco-anxiety as the chronic fear of environmental doom, which is a very intense but apt description of what it can feel like to live with this uh, affect about the environment. And It's also pretty widely agreed by mental health professionals that it's not just anxiety. It can co-occur with emotions like grief, a sense of, you know, loss for, let's say, species going extinct or coastlines you call home uh, being swallowed by sea level rise or livelihoods that are being lost as drought chokes the land, that sort of a thing. Um, But also anger, you know, Eco anger at the injustice of the fact that it's gotten this bad when we've had decades of opportunity to act and have spent that time frame not acting, <laughs> and uh, injustice, of course, about this hitting the most marginalized communities hardest and first, those who are least responsible for emissions, for example, and and so yeah, we're talking about grief, we're talking about anger, we're talking about um, anxiety, but also a sense of helplessness. Mm-hmm or powerlessness to really intervene and make a difference because no individual can reconcile this. It's so overwhelming, which can really strip away a person's agency and lead to a sense of narrative foreclosure, like a a winnowing idea of the future, what it contains and what will be possible. And all that can leave a person in a pretty despondent place. Yeah. Um, So uh, uh, apologies to listeners who, for whom this is all like hitting them for the first time. Um, so take a sec, pause if you need to. It's a lot of really heavy stuff. Um, and it is, it's existential dread, except, except there's a really good reason for it. You have a very personal relationship to these terms and you talk about it in the book. As you learned about this, this, uh, the language of these terms of the, the work being done in this field it helped you put a name to some really scary feelings you were having. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the state you found yourself in that you kind of learned your way out of or through? Yeah. Several years ago, my ego anxiety became apparent to me in a more acute way than it ever had before. I mean, I have a background in biology, studied conservation, I had been to a number of climate marches over the years. I've, I've, you know, as an independent thinking young adult, I've, I've, from very early years, I've always known about the climate crisis. It wasn't that I wasn't uh, concerned mm-hmm. or able to be negatively affected by, 
you know, the violence of humanity's actions on the environment around us. However, when my partner and I started talking seriously about trying to get pregnant in 2017, I found myself pausing rather than jumping into this stage of life that I really wanted to, because as a science communicator, ingesting all of the grim scientific reports and UN reports and squaring that with the lack of effective action just created this big dilemma. And, and I started asking for the first time, is it, is it wise to have a child given what's going on and what we're expected to see by 2050 in terms of radical change and degradation of our life support systems? And of course, that can stoke violence and conflict within human groups. Uh, and so I was wondering, is it not only wise, is it compassionate to the child, you know, and um, that made me confront a lot of anxiety about what might happen, anger about the idea that, you know, there are some people out there now, me being one of them, feeling like maybe it's our duty to prevent suffering by paying the cost of not getting to know our own children. Mm. And, you know, ecological grief was really bubbling up. And I found myself overwhelmed by the feelings and really taken by them. I mean, it really created this whole filter by which I was seeing the world. And it was made much worse because I was alone in the feelings and I didn't see anyone else talking about them right. in my community. And when I would bring it up with people, I could see that they were not on my level. And then I thought, okay, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe right. this is deranged. Maybe this is overprivileged hand wringing and catastrophic thinking. But then I would check the data and get and be like, no, the, the science is telling us it's really bad. And then um, I, I thought, okay, well, I need to do something to cope better with this because I've kind of changed overnight. Now, you know, it's kind of overflowing in my thoughts and, and coming out in my conversations consistently. And I'm becoming quite the drag to hang around because I'm always talking about <laughs> really, you know, dark, future scenarios. And, um, and I started to do the research for this book and found very quickly that I was not alone. And there was a, a really active underground conversation of people my age mm. and younger saying, hey, we are connecting family planning to the climate crisis. Many people saying, you know, we're refusing to reproduce until governments make it safe for us to do so. Mm -hmm. um, there were activist movements created around this kind of personalist political mantra, such as birth strike and no future, no children. And there were groups like Conceivable Future that I discovered held house parties around the US so people could come together and dwell on their emotional concerns as it relates to this question. And then there were just a lot of people thinking really deeply about it, like me. And that started to open up a space of no longer being so overwhelmed by the feelings, but having them be validated, which is hugely relieving. And then I, I thought, okay, great. So I'm getting a grip on this to some extent, but what are all the other emotional and psychological impacts of the climate crisis? Reproductive anxiety is a tiny sliver. Mm -hmm. What's it doing to people on the front lines of climate disaster already? How do climate scientists and activists deal with the heavy you know, toll of bearing witness to ecological decline professionally. Um, wh what does eco grief and eco anxiety mean to diverse communities that have long lived with different forms of existential threat? You know, me being a privileged middle class white Canadian woman was, you know, made to feel like the world is unsafe for the first time in my life because mm -hmm. of all this. But of course, many don't have that experience. And so, these became the seeds of the book, the questions, and also then just thinking more widely, what do we have to do then to get our mental health system prepared to deal with the scope of psychic damage that the climate crisis will cause in the decades ahead? This is just a, um, you know, I didn't want to outline the problem only, but look to the solutions of what we can do to create more resilient communities, uh, yeah. given that this is all happening. Yeah. There's a lot of your own emotion in this book, um, as you mentioned. It's not an arm's length explainer on, you know, a, the the curious field of climate anxiety. You're writing this book, and rather than turning away from the feelings that you were having, and and putting all of your energy into, you know, I, I think quote unquote what some might call real work of solving the crisis, um, you do what what feels like a counterintuitive thing, and you. Uh, turn and face these feelings straight on as observable phenomena, and and it's and it's really kind of the heart of the book. Every everything kind of comes out of that. Was there a point where you thought, 
maybe your science card might get revoked. It's definitely risky writing with memoir-esque approaches as a scientist that include your own subjectivity and emotional vulnerability. It's a big Mm no-no. Scientists are trained and taught to be objective and working from empirical data that is reproducible in in terms of the findings they're talking about and to extract any kind of emotion as irrational artifactual noise. And this is a very unfortunate binary that I wanted to antagonize because of the subject matter, but also because it's hurting the ability for us to make gains on climate and environmental action at field-wide scale. And why I say this is, for example, in the book, I interview a former lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, you know, the big IPCC UN Mm -hmm. report that comes out, who said for her entire career, she's consistently had to face politicians and staffers, key decision makers who rinse judgment on scientists who become advocates, on scientists who at all take a stand on the implications of their findings about ecological decline to then make a political argument. Because those key decision makers will always say, well, we know so-and-so is biased and on the side of climate change disaster, and therefore we can't take them seriously. And they Mm. will just totally disregard what they have to say. Now, I understand why this scientist I interviewed would then approach her work through a very careful lens of never, ever, ever letting off a whiff of emotion, because that's the easiest way to never seem like an advocate, to not have energetically charged terms Mm -hmm. um, that are emotional in nature about what ought to be done so that they will take her work seriously and maybe eventually it will affect policy. But when we have so many decades of not moving the needle at collective scale, we are disregarding the core truth that if we want to be rational, We need to also rationalize the fact that people make decisions based on emotion. We all do it all the time. And it is a falsity to imagine that we're not interpreting data through our own biases and values and working with moral clarity and and purpose that comes from an inner interrogation of emotional information. Emotions are ways of integrating data. And so finding a way to value that I think is very important for then normalizing that scientists can be very careful, rigorous, evidence-based professionals and still have emotions about what they find out and still be entire humans who are well-rounded with a moral compass that says we ought to do certain things if we want to survive and if we want to protect our children's futures, right? So I use my own vulnerability with my emotions in the book to try and model what I hope others will do so that we can normalize the incorporation of emotions in work that no doubt people have emotions about and that we have research on that many scientists try to emotionally suppress Mm -hmm. the vicarious trauma and difficulty that comes with doing climate and environmental work and that it can backfire when you try to push emotions underground and they're they're difficult and disturbing, it can lead to poor health outcomes, affect your sleep, mood, behavior, cause depression. And when it does pop up and the emotional suppression is not working anymore, a person can shame themselves an extra layer of yeah. difficulty for not being able to control it. And then they end up feeling many times worse as opposed to a healthier mode of processing emotions. And so all of this is to say that these feelings are widespread. We're in a, um, a moment when eco-anxiety and distress is, is really taking off in society at large. It's not just those on the front line of disaster or those who professionally look at the climate crisis eight plus hours a day anymore. It's regular people. It's children. It's parents. It's grandparents. It's, you know, um, anyone who is able to recognize that their own health is tied up with the health of the environment. Mm -hmm. who can feel this. And so it's a healthy response. It's a normal thing that we've evolved to have anxiety for. And it's not about catastrophic thinking in this case. So um, yeah, it's, it's tricky to answer your question. I don't know how 
judged I'm going to be, I'm sure quite a lot because a lot of scientific performance is codified and made what it is because of colleagues, um, you know, being afraid of colleagues' judgment and shame and, and an attack on one's scientific performance and legitimacy as a good researcher. And, um, you know, I just think that it's too late. It's too late to play these games. And these emotions have important things to teach us and show us. And I don't mind, um, you know, the, the, the challenges I might face as a result of doing this from colleagues because I'm trying to make a wider point about social conditioning and being able to support researchers with the heaviness of this knowledge. If we're going to live well with eco distress, we need to talk about it. We need to contain the emotions. We need to process them. And you can't do that by pretending they're not there. I think you actually write um, that it's rational to be pissed off. Yeah. And that, that really struck me um, because it, it also felt so validating. Like how, how can one read uh, the report that, is, that, that tells us that, that warming is inevitable. Things are going to get worse. It's a question of how bad and how fast the idea that you would look at that, um, that you would look at that dispassionately and go, well, well, everyone learned to swim and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, we're, we're at an asteroid hurtling towards the earth. Uh, I think anyone not screaming would, would, would be deemed insane, um, but it's a slow asteroid. So we're supposed to be calm, I guess. Right. Right. We have the UN secretary general telling us that it is a code red for humanity. Yeah. And now using language that is just as radical as Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop mm-hmm. Oil, others who are hitting the streets, gluing themselves to fossil fuel infrastructure, making the point that we have to tell the truth about heading for extinction mm-hmm. and do what we must in radical ways to, to change everything quickly, dramatically, and curb emissions and create regenerative societies. And we have the most kind of sober multilateral politician <laughs> defending them as yeah. he is. Yeah. And saying the real radicals are those who are continuing to invest in fossil fuel projects, mm. uh, the dangerous radicals that that is, um, you know, we really need to slow down and pause and connect with how we feel about all of this. This is not about going home and making dinner and having another day in the books. This is about massive transformation and what it means to be alive at this time. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, people are feeling it. Um, We had uh, the astrophysicist uh, Chanda Prescott-Weinstein on the show a while ago, and she spoke about how science isn't really good about about hearing no as the answer for what it wants to go learn. Mm -hmm. We want to build this telescope here, but there's an indigenous community that would rather we didn't. And science really wants to just get them to yes and not end at, we're not building the telescope. Yeah, We're not going to see what what we would like to see, and we've got to live with that. And and for me, that was upsetting because it's, you know, the pursuit of knowledge is like, I realized like, oh, I, I hold that as an intrinsic good, but social justice is also an intrinsic. So for me, it was, it was clashing and your book kind of built on that when you got into interrogating um, the kind of enlightenment thinking, the empiricism that we hold as the kind of backbone of this, of this dispassionate view of things. It's also, it's a weapon that's been wielded for horrible things throughout history. And, and it, I found that helpful in kind of divorcing myself from that as like, as an ideal, was that a transformation you kind of had to go through yourself or were you kind of already there? Were you already sort of, you had peeked behind the curtain of like science theater mm. and you were bringing the reader there? Or was that part of, was that part of your own, your own growth and your thinking as well? I had peeked behind the curtain because in earlier education, um, you know, graduate work for many years ago, I'd been embedded in what's called science, technology, and society studies. Mm -hmm. And so it's really the integration of science, politics, and society and understanding the subjectivities of what we come to call objective, that particular people at particular times in history with particular values create the foundations that we take for granted today in terms of how the world works and how we measure it and and so on and so forth. And, you know, in my, my first book, Rise of the Necrofauna, I was really trying to ask questions about not only the how of what these scientists on the edge of synthetic biology 
are doing to try and recreate close versions of extinct species in order to put these proxy animals into failing ecosystems as some kind of conservation tool. But I was really digging into the should we do this, the 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 ethical and social implications, the violence that this might unleash unintended, though it is. And from going deep on that project for many years and talking to many ethicists and asking them, you know, when the microphone is off, have you ever seen ethical arguments truly slow down a mega engineering or science project? And the answer was almost always no. You know, we have really bright, talented minds devoting their entire lively legacy of intellectual work towards productive frameworks of, of, of you know, ethical scrutiny of, of projects that come from this idea of human progress. And we can have all the fancy meetings and we can write the grants for it and we can create the budget that shows that we care about these things. And it often ends up just being a tick box exercise, window dressing, showing that you've done the right thing. At the end of the day, you're still doing what you wanted to from the first place if you're, you know, the capital S scientist on the grant or on the project. And it, it really is more about performance often than it is about practical amendment and transformation. And that is what you're talking about, <laughs> you know, and in this trade-off between social justice and science and what it wants to know and the power and the capital and the, the potential for, for translation into, you know, companies and, and applications and things like that. It's just so, so powerful. And it marries so well with the larger system of, um, you know, what we're measuring, which is GDP and growth rather mm-hmm. than like human and environmental well-being. <laughs> that science wins at the end of the day because it gets tied up with those interests. So yeah, I, I had been absorbing these and I kind of see it everywhere I look and, and it became also fruitful to this project. But here I was really, what was new for me was trying to understand, okay, I can link the climate crisis to the industrial revolution, to extractivism, to logics of colonialism and indigenous genocide and imperialism. And like, understanding how they work together. But how did we even arrive at this place where the people in charge have this dominating view of of human exceptionalism all over all other kinds of life and also within the human race, you know, certain kinds Mm -hmm. of humans dominating over others. And it was that interrogation of, okay, where this dominated mindset might come from looking at many cultures that don't have that dominating mindset. And then what could we do, what we could do to think about shifting to partnership which is what we know we require in order to live healthily, given the pressures we're up against um, with the climate and water eco crisis. That uh, some of the questions you're asking me now about led me to some new thinking that I hadn't done before. Mm. You referred to your earlier book and the work you did on researching de extinction. That, from a reader's point of view, it seemed it seems like between the two books you shift from being the kind of science writer who is showing a thing that there may not be an audience for, you may or may not be interested in this. You should be interested in in it because, because all these things look at this, this book is not about, Hey, this is interesting. This book, it it fits into a place where few science books fit, which is, Hey, you're, you're completely panicked or worried or distraught over a thing. Let me help you put some structure around that and find your way through it. Mm It's not a self-help book, but it, but it performs an emotional function like that. Yeah. And, and how conscious were you of that or was rise of the necrophana that as well, but maybe, maybe not so directly. No, your instinct is, is correct. So rise of the necrophana, I think sitting back now and looking at the fact that I spent many years with both subjects, looking at de-extinction was highly emblematic of the way that I engaged with the ecological crisis. I cared. Mm-hmm. I worked on it. I thought about it. I wanted to know what those leading a variety of fields that touch on it are doing. Um, and then through a very intellectual frame, I analyzed it in that book, this quizzical, strange approach to new conservation biology tools um, that have to do with basically Jurassic Park and recreating extinct species. <laughs> Entertaining and troubling. Great. Mm-hmm. 
but there was not an emotionally profound reckoning that came with it. Mm -hmm. And then what happened with the second book with Generation Dread is that I had a total breakdown in my psychological defenses around Mm -hmm. the ecological crisis. It could no longer be contained as this intellectual aspect of my life. And it became profoundly emotional and psychologically disruptive. And so that was a total 180 reframe, troubled me, but really fascinated me. (laughs) It's like, okay, I've now ended up in a totally different neighborhood around the ecological crisis. Is there something zeitgeisty going on? Might there be more than just me sitting here alone and ingesting all these (laughs) scientific papers all the time feeling this way? And what does this say about our society right now and, and how far we've come in the ecological crisis and what we can do about it? So I think that's why the tone is so completely different because it was really authentic to my own emotional rupturing around the topic. Mm -hmm. And I was really hungry. Like someone, please throw me a fricking bone here. Show me what to do with these emotions because they're pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I could not find many forms of assistance. And so I thought, okay, well, Hey, I'll, I'll write the book that I wish I had. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to um, imagine that there are going to be other people out there who feel like me, especially around this childbearing dilemma, which I didn't see in any book form at all. Mm-hmm. Um, may, maybe I can, yeah, I'll have to expose myself and that's going to be uncomfortable and cringy, but I'll do it only to serve the wider conversation around mental health and the climate crisis and bring in other people's stories and research. And that's why it does feel self-helpy is mm-hmm. because I guess it, it is kind of self-helpy. I, I helped myself in order to hopefully help some others with it, but it rides that line between also being, you know, a nonfiction account of an emerging burgeoning field around climate and mental health. And then this, this memoir stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, the book has key takeaways in it. That's pretty self-helpy. I wanted to ask you about the key takeaways because I actually felt that I felt it was helpful in nailing down what I, what I could learn because, because as I said, in, uh, off the top, the, the, your, the depth of your research is, is, is profound here. You've, there's a lot, you've, you synthesized a tremendous amount of scholarship, uh, activism. Um, you're working in history where we need it. There's a lot happening. And, and I found the key takeaways, first of all, surprising because it's so seldom that the author does you the favor of saying, now, listen, it's been, you've been reading for an hour. Uh, in this case, I was listening to the audiobook, so you literally were just telling me what I needed to take away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask, how did you, how did you envision this book living in the world? How, like, who did you imagine as your audience? Um, right. You know, now as it as it hits the world, and and in the future as it as it lives, and I think takes its place among like you know important touchstones of of how we understand the climate crisis. Right. Well, first and foremost, the imagined reader was an eco-distressed person. They didn't have to be only a young person, as many people think, because of the title Generation Dread, assuming that it's for Gen Z. I can understand that assumption, but it's actually for anyone who, as I mentioned, recognizes their health is tied up with the health of the environment and are now being emotionally affected by that because the environment is not doing so great. Um, And it was about uh, extending a kind of bridge to them and some compassion and validation and ideas about how to work with those emotions. Um, the second imagined reader is colleagues, researchers, um, policymakers, people who need to know about the valid interconnection between the climate crisis and mental health so that they can do something about it, so that they can not only study and articulate the problem, but work towards innovative solutions and ways of addressing it and preparing for it to get worse in the decades ahead, which requires being strategic now about reforming health systems. So those are the two. It's really about, hey, ego distress is real. It's a serious problem. It can be harnessed for constructive action. It can be adaptive, but you can't get there on your own if you're wallowing in the overwhelm stuck at the bottom of a U-shaped curve. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other is, hey, 
we don't need to start from scratch here. We have some pretty powerful ideas about how to get mental health care into low resource settings. We know a lot from psychiatric epidemiology about what helps communities ride out the psychiatric trauma that comes from disasters much better than other types of communities. And with just very basic support, we can help get that kind of structure into places that are vulnerable now. Well, one of the, one of the readers I hope for the book is, um, is someone I actually put onto your newsletter, Jen Dredd, when, oh. uh, when you started it a couple of years ago, because he, th- this friend of mine was, was kind of publicly like going through what looked like the feelings you were going through. Mm. He was on the other side of parenthood. He had, he had two young kids, uh, just a little bit younger than, than my pair of kids. And so when, when you launched the newsletter, I was, I was sent it right away. I was like, this is, this is for you. Um, oh, wow. I hope it brings you something. And to what extent was the newsletter? I mean, you started the newsletter some time ago. How did it relate to the book? Was it kind of the, was it the sort of the, the, the soil from which the book sprouted or was it something else? It was something else. So essentially I had done a ton of interviews by the time I started the newsletter almost two years ago. Now I had, you know, taken my key texts and uh, arguments and big bulks of the research that are going into the book. I was still writing the book, of course. And, you know, I didn't know how many years ahead of me. I still had until the book would come out, but I knew it was a long time. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, the tremor of eco distress out there in the world was starting to rise. There were increasing articles and very mainstream outlets, especially focusing on young people's despair and hopelessness. Um, Not only, we also talked about other groups, but I was particularly concerned about the consistent discussion of the problem around how young people are feeling and then no or very few framings of what to do with those emotions. And I thought, okay, I can't, I can't just sit on all this stuff when it feels like an urgent rising public health issue. And although I don't have answers and I can't take away people's pain and I'm not a clinician and I'm not allowed to give advice like a therapist, maybe I can start sharing some of the insights I'm gaining from my research in a way that will be soothing Mm. and and, you know, validate other people's distress from, you know, this kind of this vibe of kinship <laughs> and and see what can come from that. And so I started the newsletter just to be able to to address the conversation, start building a community around this and test the waters and also see, like, how is this landing with other people? Is this a thing? I mean, it's I know it's a thing, but but what does this mean for being able to hear from people directly and not just read about it in the news, right? And see what what pe- folks are grappling with, how it's showing up in their life and what they're hungry for. And it it has been a very amazing experience. The people who are part of the newsletter are deeply engaged with these questions and emotions and really, you know, teaching me a lot of things, but they also sometimes do fill my inbox with their nightmares. And I sometimes have young people who are su- suicidal about their, because of their climate anxiety writing me. And it can be very distressing, but an important reminder of how much this work is needed. I don't mm-hmm. mean my work. I mean, the field, the world of yeah. climate and mental health and what we can do to advance it. And so it's a great motivator and it brings meaning. Um but yeah, thank you for for sharing that with your friend. Yeah, uh, I think he's I think he's doing better. And the newsletter showed up at exactly the right time. I was like, oh my god, there's actually structure around this. Um, there's it's not it's not just a, a an amorphous ball of feelings that we're going to have to swallow because there's nothing we can do. Right. But in fact, there's there's a discipline around this, and it and it will um, it'll get us to a place where we can actually be productive and 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 do something useful instead of instead yeah. of just being full of fear. Yeah. I want to now shift to ask you uh, just a little bit about the rise of the necrofauna. Um, mm-hmm. Because as, as I, as I noted, it's a, it's a book I read when it came out, that book is uh, it's very much the kind of book, as you described it earlier, that, you know, um, when people say, I like reading books about science, that's the kind of book that they have either read or they need to read. And, um, and I wanted to ask you as uh, thinking about, 
the life of a science communicator, especially one like you who who has covered so many things. I listened to to, to the BBC uh, podcast as well, Tomorrow's World. Oh my so gosh! Wow, cool. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. This is sounding like is this guy a Brit Ray super fan? I just listen to a lot of stuff. Okay, <laughs> like just let's let's all calm down. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Calm down. Okay. <laughs> A science writer often has to skip from one thing to another. You're communicating not from necessarily uh, one specialized field, but sometimes you're 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 having to uh, communicate to a lay person uh, from a variety of different fields. And I want to ask you, how deep are you still in the developments in the different technologies of de- that go into de extinction? Not very much. Not very much. I have made a big gear shift. I was. You know, academically focused on synthetic biology, and I was consulting in a private synthetic biology company for years. Mm. And you know, the book, of course, uh, all of that is is relating to a different neighborhood of science than the one I'm in now. Because Generation Dread, you know, my meaning focused coping got me to change my not only my writing but my academic research to do this mental health stuff now. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I'm certainly intrigued, and I will read the articles that come out on it when they cross my desk, but I'm not, I'm not doing the kind of close uh, work of a science communicator in that space at all anymore. There's just not enough time. Yeah. Yeah. Is Rise of the Necrofauna the kind of book that you would have read when you were a kid? Mm. Yeah, I would have read that in high school. Yeah, I think that's the kind of thing, uh, just as my spark of curiosity around science and and the awe that it can bring, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of inspiring aspect of, of scientific, inde- scientific endeavor, which is so great for young people um, to imagine seeing themselves as a scientific person. I think that that would be the kind of book that would bring me in, especially because it's not just technical, um, but focusing on those larger human questions of, of ethics and societal implications. Mm-hmm. But when I was younger, I mean, I didn't really get into the science thing full fledged until I left home and was in university. When I was a child reader, I remember being, for example, really taken with the book Memoirs of a Geisha. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) Oprah can't be wrong, can she? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, You know, I think that came out when I was 11 or something. And My brother, who's a lot older than me, married a Japanese woman. We got to go to Japan and go to Kyoto and like go to where the old ancient um, geisha neighborhood is. And that, you know, the pairing of those two things then just lit my mind on fire. That's the kind of reader I was. If if you could transport me to a place, I don't mean you physically travel there, but just the books I was drawn to were about magical realms or, you know, lands that were not the quotidian experience I was having. You looked for immersion. Yeah. I looked for immersion. Um, I remember being obsessed with, uh, when I was really young, Grawl Dolls, the Witches. Oh, yeah. Stuff like okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, not it wasn't clear that I was going to be a science communicator, that's for sure. Right. You didn't have a pile of books, like you know, Stephen Jay Gold or, or, uh, or Stephen Hawking. I'm realizing now how many popular science writers are named Steve. Um, but I know. That wasn't your thing. That w- that's not where you're at. It became so when I got to university and my professors impressed exactly all these Stevens upon me (laughs) and I loved it, (laughs) but I would say that was a bit more of a mature reading it because by then I was 18 and out of the house and doing Mm. different things. Yeah. Yeah. When you're not reading emails from newsletter uh, readers, when you're not reading journals about the, at the frontier of, of uh, climate aware psychology and therapy, and all that other stuff you have to do uh, as yeah. as an academic and researcher. What do you what do you read for fun? Well, as one of these kind of people who overcommits herself to lots of projects, I find that I have to read a lot of stuff, even for fun, that relates to my topics. If you know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, but it's not that it's not fun. Yeah. So, yeah. for example, if I'm reading Elizabeth Colbert's Under the White Sky or The Sixth Extinction, it's both for fun and it informs my work. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, Bill McKibben's Falter, any Naomi Klein book, even Rebecca Solnit books, um, mm-hmm. of which there are many. Those kinds of authors I find I would be reading even if I was still doing synthetic biology, you know, 
Um, and it kind of informs my approach to dealing with science and society and, and human questions. I mean, books that I've really enjoyed in the last couple of years, apart from those, um, like rereading Rebecca Skloot's The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I think mm-hmm. it's such a masterpiece in science communication and storytelling. Um, or like Nathaniel Rich's Losing Earth. I don't know if you read that one or... Um, you know, Jonathan Safran Flores, We Are the Weather. These are these are all things that are double dipping yeah. as workbooks. Yeah. But I would bring to the beach anyway. As a as a person who's worked as a bookseller all his life and now finds finds himself doing things like hosting this this podcast. Uh yeah, mm-hmm. I, I I relate pretty strongly to uh if if we're gonna have a guest, I'm gonna have to read their book. So I'd I'd, I'd better already be interested in it. <laughs> right. As you're having conversations about generation dread as you're having conversations like this, or, you know, you're introducing yourself and, and you're explaining this area that you work in. Do people confess to you? Is that the life you now find yourself living where, as you talk to people, you have to hear about their eco sins? Yes. (laughs) More so their eco feelings and their sins, thankfully, Mm. because it would be really, I think, tiring if people were kind of lamenting their use of plastic straws and feeling guilty about recycling habits when that stuff is really not impactful compared to the collective action form. Yeah. I do hear a lot about um, the fear and sorrow. You know, people I don't know mm. tell maybe they figure out what I do and then will feel comfortable. And again, this is because I've shared my own story in a vulnerable way, and then they will immediately share theirs which wasn't something I'd calculated. I don't mind, honestly. Um, I, I think it's amazing to be able to connect with people you don't know about something deep and meaningful to them, even if it's painful. But, um, you know, like a woman in my office building the other day saw, an, an, you know, the little write-up for a book talk that I'm giving. And, and then she told me about the day out of the blue when um, due to wildfires choking this guy in San Francisco, the turn, this guy had turned that Blade Runner orange it was like this apocalypse day that everyone talks about. And she was pregnant with her second child and she just became overwhelmed with doom and this question of what the heck am I doing? And, you know, then the spiraling about what this means for her children and um, for that to be the first encounter with a, with a person that's in your office building is pretty interesting in terms of changing social convention. And also, like I write about in the book, this, this time I gave, I gave a talk at a conference, talked a little bit about ecological grief. And then I got a message from a woman who said, you know, thank you for voicing my feelings out loud because I feel so much sorrow for the animals. I don't know what to do. Like I stayed up last mm-hmm. night, just reading articles after article about the 3 billion animals that perished in the Australian bushfires. And it's, it's too much like, can you meet for a coffee? And then I meet the stranger for, for a coffee. And before we even get to pour the coffee, she just bursts into tears, you know, because she finally knows that there's some place, some, you know, for her emotions to land where they will be accepted. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, it is creating different kinds of experiences like that, but not always. Often people will also just kind of be tight-lipped about it. Like, oh, interesting. You talk about existential feelings. <laughs> strange <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh brit i want to thank you for joining us um this has been uh just a delight thank you nathan this was such a nice conversation yeah i appreciate being on i have been speaking with dr Britt ray author of generation dread finding purpose in an age of climate crisis you can find it and every book we talked about at kobo and conversations home on the web at kobo.com conversation check the show notes for a link and make sure to catch every conversation by subscribing wherever you listen kobo and conversation is of course produced by me hosted by me too uh michael tamblin will be back soon thank you so much for listening